continue in our series on the kingdom of God. The kingdom is near. And this morning, our title is The King on the Throne. Many of you might have heard people talk about the kingdom of God and talk about the kingdom of heaven. Now, what's the difference between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven? Are they the same? Are they different? Well, some people think they're very different. Some people think they're the same. This morning, I just want to look at uh, two very short passages. In Mark chapter 1, verse 15, it says, The time has come, this is Jesus speaking, the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. The time has come, the kairos time, the divinely appointed time by Christ has come, and the kingdom of God now is near. In Matthew, we read this. In those days, John the Baptist came, preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. Mark is quoting Jesus as saying the kingdom of God, and Matthew is quoting John the Baptist as saying the kingdom of heaven. And you might think that maybe John was speaking about something that's different than what Jesus was speaking about. But Matthew helps us out. In chapter 19, he records this, Jesus speaking to the disciples. Truly I tell you, it is hard for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. Truly I tell you, when you see those words, it's very important. Jesus is communicating a truth that he wants to emphasize. Truly I tell you. Please listen up. This is very important. It is hard for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. So Jesus is talking about the kingdom of heaven in this quotation. And then he follows up in the very next verse, still the words of Jesus. Again, I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. In those two verses, back to back, Matthew is recording for us the words of Jesus Christ himself. And in verse 23, he talks about the kingdom of heaven, and in verse 24, he talks about the kingdom of God. In verse 23, Jesus says, Truly I tell you, very important, please take note of this, and then in verse 24, he says, again, I tell you. He's making clear that he is expanding on his first thought. He's making clear that there's a connection, a continuation between verses 23 and 24. This is not a new idea that's being presented. This is the same idea that is restated. Again, I tell you. So clearly... In the teaching of Jesus, he is equating the kingdom of heaven with the kingdom of God. That he uses both of these, and it's the same thing. He's talking about the same entity, the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God. In fact, it's only Matthew that really uses the word terms kingdom of heaven. The other gospel writers both, uh, all use the kingdom of God. So... Why does Matthew do that? Well, it seems to be because Matthew is writing to a Jewish audience that for the Jewish audience to hear the word, um, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God um, might not be that, um, that easy to listen to um, because for the Jewish folks, they didn't want to even say the name of God out loud and to even use the name of God or to hear the name of God again and again might not be as easy for them to listen to. But someone else said, well, maybe Matthew knows 
that the Jewish audience understands that the God that he's talking about is the Jewish God. Uh, whereas the other gospel writers are writing to Gentile people, and maybe they don't understand that the kingdom that we're talking about is the kingdom of the Jewish God. Yahweh, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And that's the reason. Be that as it may, what's clear to us is that Jesus is using these interchangeably, and I think that's the correct way to interpret it. The kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven is the same thing. Let us turn to our passage this morning, and we are again in the same passage in Mark chapter 1, reading from the NIV. The beginning of the good news about Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. And so John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. The whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him. Confessing their sins, they were baptized by him in the Jordan River. John wore clothing made of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. And this was his message. After me comes the one more powerful than I, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. At that time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. Just as Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven. You are my son, whom I love. With you, I am well pleased. At once, the Spirit sent him out into the wilderness. And he was in the wilderness 40 days, being tempted by Satan. He was with the wild animals, and the angels attended him. After John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. This is the word of the Lord. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the gospel writer Mark. We thank you for the truth contained therein. I pray this morning as we stop and pause and think about the kingdom of God, the king who is on the throne, I pray that you would strengthen our faith. I pray that you would help us to be confident in what we believe. And I pray that you would speak to us through your Holy Spirit. This is our prayer in the name of Jesus. Amen. Mark records that Jesus went around Galilee and proclaimed the good news. The good news that the kingdom of God was near. The time had arrived and God's kingdom was now breaking into the earthly reality. The long-awaited hope was fulfilled right before their eyes. Now, this God of course, we know, is the Jewish God. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The God, Yahweh, who disclosed himself and his identity to Moses at the burning bush. This is the God we are talking about when we say that the God is the king who is on the throne. This is not a God of the Roman pantheon or one of the Greek gods or one of the Sumerian gods, or one of the, any of the other nations of the earth. It wasn't any of their gods. It was a very specific God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of Israel. He is the God who is King of kings and Lord of lords. He is on the throne of the universe. 
this specific particular king. He was also committed to all nations. He is the God of Israel. He is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but he is also the God of the whole earth. All people and all nations have to serve and bow their knee to the God of Israel. This particular God, from the very beginning, God is committed to all the people that He has made. He makes a covenant with Noah. And when He makes this covenant with Noah, He says that He's, not, he's going to um, never again have the earth be flooded, never again wipe out all living creatures. And he gives Noah a very specific command. He tells Noah to go and to be fruitful and to fill the earth. It's the same command he gave to Adam and Eve in the beginning. But as he does this with Noah, what happens is that the people now who are blessed, the people who are produced, the people who are the fruit of Noah's loins, are from all nations on the earth not just from one nation. I want to uh, read this from Leslie Newbegin. He is a very celebrated missionary to India for many years, and he is a theologian and a missiologist, and uh, this is what he has to say. He says, "To, To begin with the Genesis story of humankind's second start after the disasters of total corruption and flood, The saga shows us Noah and his family coming out of the ark and receiving the unconditional promise of God's blessing on his whole race and on the physical world. Humankind sets out under the rainbow, which is the sacrament of the primal covenant with all humankind and with the created world for humanity's sake. Noah is told to be fruitful and multiply and to replenish the earth. Immediately there follows the list of the 70 nations, the heathen, who are the fruit of the blessing. These nations will be in the background of the story that follows. But at the outset, we are reminded that their existence is the fruit of God's primal blessing. In the Old Testament, we see that the nation of Israel becomes the focus of the story. The other nations exist in the background. But as we read that, we can so easily be tempted to think that God was only concerned about Israel and not about the nations. That would be a mistake. Because all the nations are the fruit of God's blessing. God's concern is for all the nations. But He has a special purpose for Israel. Israel is chosen. Israel is elected to bring God's blessing to the nations. To be the bearer of God's blessing. Salvation comes from Israel. Salvation comes from the Israel people through Jesus Christ to the nations. And we see this from the earliest days. Now, Leslie Newbegin says this better than I can say that, so I'm going to read again how he puts this. He says, There follows the sad story of the effort of the nations to create their own unity. Babel, the archetype of Nineveh and Rome and any of the other great civilizations, the end is disastrous. But God is patient, and God makes another beginning. Among the 70 nations, the camera focuses now on the family of Eber. Among the descendants of Eber, Abraham is chosen to begin the adventure of faith, to get out from his own people, not knowing the end of the road, but trusting the one who calls. He is promised the blessing. But it is not only for himself, it is for the nations. Remember the covenant God makes with Abraham, where God says, I will bless you, and you will be a blessing. 
All the nations of the earth, all the families of the earth will be blessed in you. Abraham is going to be the conduit. God's blessing is going to flow through God's people. But God's blessing is not only for His people. His blessing is for all the nations. Because He is the God who is on the throne of the whole world. All nations will bow down to the God of Israel. Abraham will be the bearer of God's primal blessing for all the nations. But the narrowing continues. Not all of Abraham's children are chosen to be the bearers of the blessing. Isaac is chosen. Ishmael is not. Among Isaac's sons, Jacob, not Esau, is chosen. The story goes on and the narrowing continues. Among the tribes of Israel, Judah is chosen. And the rest disappear to the margin of the picture. Within Judah, it's only a smaller and smaller remnant that is the bearer of the blessing. But the rest never disappear completely from the picture. Those who are chosen to be bearers are chosen for the sake of all. The covenant with Noah is not revoked. The promised blessing is in the end for all the nations. Abraham, Israel, the tribe of Judah, the faithful remnant, they are all bearers of a blessing for the nations. They are bearers, but they are not exclusive beneficiaries. There lay the constant temptation. Again and again it had to be said that election is for responsibility, not for privilege. Again and again, unfaithful Israel had to be threatened with punishment because it was the elect of God. In Amos, God says to, to Israel, You only have I known of all the families of the earth. Therefore, I will punish you for all your iniquities. They are in this relationship with God where God will punish them when they do wrong because God is invested in them to have His blessing come to the nations through this people. And God's call is irrevocable. God doesn't walk away when Israel is unfaithful. God doesn't walk away when Israel turns around and rejects the king. God says to Samuel, they didn't reject you, Samuel, they rejected me as king. But he doesn't reject his people. Because God's call is going to bear fruit as God has called these people to be the bearers of the blessing for the nations. Now, in the, in the book of Jonah, this is very, very clear. This is Leslie Newbegin that has this insight. He says, Jonah is called to go and bear witness in the midst of Nineveh. Nineveh, as we know, is this great city of the, of the heathen, of the Gentiles, of the pagans. Nineveh stands for Babylon or Rome or New York City or any great city that is full of sin and, 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 uh, and evil. There you go. Jonah cannot face the challenge. He seeks to evade it and escape from the pressure of God's calling. He thinks he has succeeded. He sleeps soundly while God whips up a raging storm and the pagan soldiers devoutly pray for deliverance. It's an interesting point to note. It is the pagans who have to summon Jonah to his prayers. When lots are cast, Jonah is forced to confess his guilt. But as he confesses his guilt, he also confesses his God. The God of heaven who made the sea and the dry land. Jonah is ready to pay for his sin with his life. Remember, he says, throw me overboard. But the conversion of pagan soldiers by this improbable missionary has already begun. They labor to save Jonah, and they pray to the Lord. But Jonah must be thrown to the sea. The grain of wheat must fall into the ground and die. The elect must suffer. The church must lose its life. But out of death, there is a resurrection. 
A penitent and restored Jonah goes to speak God's word to the pagan world, and his obedience is met by a stupendous miracle. There is universal repentance. The whole city of Nineveh, remember, comes and repents. The pagan world has been humbled. But Jonah is bitterly disappointed. The heathen are not punished after all. What justice can there be in the world where God is so absurdly generous? Jonah wanted the heathen to be punished, but God wanted the heathen to be saved. Jonah was not to be a messenger of judgment to them. Jonah was to be the bearer of blessing to them. When they responded to him, God's blessing flowed. And you think, you'd think that Jonah would be rejoicing, but he wasn't. What is the point of missions? If these people are not going to be punished, Jonah is frustrated and angry. He settles himself on the edge of the city. Or as a Tamil Christian friend has suggested, the mission compound. To see what would become of the city. And we are left with a picture of Jonah sulking while God pleads with him for Nineveh. That great city with its thousands of innocent babies and its dumb animals. God so tenderly pleading for the pagan world, and Jonah so sullenly wrapped up in his own self-pity. Ouch. It is Jonah who must take God's message to Nineveh. He is the elect bearer of God's promise of blessing for the nations. No one else can bring the blessing. But the election and the promise are for Nineveh, for the nations, not for Jonah alone. As God's chosen one, he must suffer. God will not let him off, but God will also not let him go. For God does not cancel his calling. I've never thought of the story of Jonah in this way. But we understand God's concern. His concern is for the nations. His concern is for every living creature on this planet. And His election is not for privilege, but for responsibility. His blessing is going to flow through His chosen people. And God is going to have His blessing flow through them in order to bless all the nations, because He is the God over all nations. He is the King on the throne of the universe. He is Israel's God, but He is the God of all nations, using Israel to be the bearers of His blessing for the nations. Now, when Jesus comes and He preaches, proclaiming the good news, that the kingdom of God has come near. He is urging people to repent and to believe this good news. John is the one that is the forerunner before Jesus. He prepares the way. And John is the one that comes and preaches repentance and a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Now, I might be the only one seeing this, but it seems to me that what John is doing here is similar to what happened in Exodus as the Israelites came out of Egypt. And they wanted to, to be with God, and they came to the Mount Sinai, and they wanted to meet with God. The Lord said to Moses at that time, Go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow. Have them wash their clothes and be ready by the third day, because on that day the Lord will come down on Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people. God is going to meet with the people, not just with Moses. 
He was meeting with Moses before, but God wanted to meet with all the people. He said, get them ready. Have them wash their clothes. Have them consecrate themselves. Have them repent of their sins and be ready to meet with the Holy God. Now it seems to me that what John the Baptist did before Jesus came was similar to what Moses did before God came to meet with his people. That John the Baptist was calling people to repent, to get their lives ready, and to wash themselves in the River Jordan so that they can be consecrated because the presence of God was coming in their midst. Not the God of Sinai, but the Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the very presence of God was coming to them. So the people had to be ready for this God to come and meet with them. The people had to consecrate themselves, wash themselves. It's, maybe I'm the only person to see that parallel there, but I think that's what part of what, what John the Baptist was about, was getting the people ready for the presence of God coming into their midst. This kingdom of God coming was a kingdom coming in the very life of Christ himself. The kingdom was present in Christ. Now, there's a very interesting passage in Daniel. I want to read this passage, uh, just a few verses here, as the king, and you all know the story about the king who has his dream, and he is asking all his wise men to interpret the dream for him. But there's a twist to the story because the king doesn't trust his advisors and his wise men. And so he said to them, I don't only want you to interpret the dream for me, but I want you to tell me what I dreamt. You have to tell me what I dreamt, and then you have to interpret the dream for me. And of course, they all throw their hands in the air. They said, who can do this? No human being can do this. Only the gods can do this, and they don't dwell with men. But then Daniel is found. And the God, who is the God of Israel, who is the God of all the nations, who is the king on the throne, is the one that discloses to Daniel what the king dreamt in his own private capacity, and then gives him the interpretation. <clears throat> so Daniel comes and he interprets. He says, as you were lying there, O king, your mind turned to the things to come, and the revealer of mysteries showed you what is going to happen. As for me, this mystery has been revealed to me, not because I have greater wisdom than other living men, but so that you, O king, may know that the inter interpretation and that you may understand what went through your mind. You looked, O king, and there before you stood a large statue, an enormous, dazzling statue, awesome in appearance. The head of the statue was made of pure gold, its chest and arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of baked clay. While you were watching, a rock was cut out, but not by human hands. It struck the statue on its feet of iron and clay and smashed them. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were broken to pieces at the same time and became like chaff on the threshing floor in the summer. The wind swept them away without leaving a trace. But the rock that struck the statue became a huge mountain and filled the whole earth. This was the dream. And now we will interpret it to the king. You, O king, are the king of kings. The God of heaven has given you dominion and power and might and glory. In your hands he has placed mankind and the beasts of the field and the birds of the air. Wherever they live, he has made you ruler over them. You are the head of gold. After you, another kingdom will, will rise inferior to yours. Next, a third kingdom, one of bronze, will rule over the whole earth. Finally, there will be a fourth kingdom, strong as iron, for iron breaks and smashes everything. 
and as iron breaks things to pieces, so it will crush and break all the others. Just as you saw that the feet and the toes were partly of baked clay and partly of iron, so this will be a divided kingdom, yet it will have some of the strength of iron in it, even as you saw iron mixed with the clay. As the toes were partly iron and partly clay, so this kingdom will be partly strong and partly brittle. And just as you saw the iron mixed with baked clay, so the people will be a mixture and will not remain united any more than the iron mixes with the clay. And this is the important part. In the time of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed. Nor will it be left to another people. It will crush all those kingdoms and bring them to an end, but it will itself endure forever. This is the meaning of the vision of the rock cut out of a mountain, but not by human hands. A rock that broke the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold to pieces. The great God has shown the king what will take place in the future. The dream is true, and its interpretation is trustworthy. In the time of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom. Now, as you think about that statue, that dream that the king had, the king himself, the king of Babylon, is the head of gold. So the first kingdom, the kingdom of gold, is Babylon. Then the kingdom of Medo-Persia. Then the kingdom of Greece. And then the last kingdom, the kingdom of Rome. These were all the kingdoms that ruled the world in succession. And at that time, God's kingdom will arrive. The rock that was not broken, not by human hands, that rock will come. And that rock will come and it will grow and become like a mountain and fill the whole earth. This is the vision given to the king of what needs to take place in the world. Daniel made this clear. So when Jesus Christ comes and says that the kingdom has now come near, we understand from the vision of Daniel that this rock has now been cut loose, that this rock has now landed on the earth, and that this rock will now grow to become a mountain, and this rock will fill the whole earth. And of this kingdom, there will be no end. All of this has been set in motion at this time. So when Jesus arrives and says, this is the good news, the good news of the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God has come near. This has been set in motion. Jesus carries this presence of the kingdom in his own body, and he proclaims the kingdom in Galilee of the Gentiles. That's what's very interesting, is that when Jesus starts to preach, he goes out into Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God. He goes out into where the Gentiles are, where the nations are, to proclaim the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God has always had at its focus all the nations, the whole earth. The rock that is going to come down is going to fill the whole earth. This has always been God's plan. But it would always flow through His elect, through His chosen vessels, which was the people of Israel, which became the person of Jesus Christ. Salvation is from the Jews. But this kingdom is like a two-edged sword because it brings both blessing and judgment. When Jesus starts his earthly ministry, his first big sermon, he says, The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. 
He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from, from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And there he ended in the quotation that we find of his first sermon. But he was quoting from this passage in Isaiah, and this passage doesn't end there. The passage says in the very next line, the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God. The day of the Lord, the coming of the kingdom, is a two-edged sword. It has blessing in it and it has judgment. Even as Jesus proclaims the blessings for the kingdom, at the same time, God's judgment is there as well. Remember John the Baptist started wondering when he was in, in prison, was wondering about Jesus and sent his disciples to ask Jesus, are you the one to come or are we to wait for another? And then Jesus replied to him, Go back and report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive sight, the lame walk. Those who have leprosy are cleansed. The deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is proclaimed to the poor. All the blessings of the kingdom right there. But then Jesus adds this line, Blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me. Blessed is, not any, blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me, who doesn't take offense, who is not judged, who is not part of the judgment of this coming of the kingdom. The blessings of the kingdom is here. Go tell John, this is all happening. But tell him as well, that those who don't take offense at me will be blessed. In the, at the very first time when Jesus preaches in a synagogue, and he preaches the sermon we spoke about from Isaiah chapter 61, there are people who take him afterwards to kill him. The very people who he was preaching to took offense at him and wanted to go and kill him. And the message of Jesus is that the kingdom is coming with blessings for all nations. But don't take offense at that. Don't take offense and don't stumble on account of me. Blessing and judgment together, this is the kingdom of God. This is the day of the Lord. Jesus is calling on people to repent. Repent because the kingdom of God is near. Repenting means to turn away from their own selfish, sinful ways and to embrace the kingdom. To welcome the rule and the reign of God in their lives. It's the same today, brothers and sisters. The kingdom of God is here. The kingdom of God came with Jesus Christ. That rock came tumbling down. That kingdom came and broke into our reality and to our world. And as at the time of Jesus, he was urging people to make a decision to repent because the kingdom was near. In the same way, today we have to make a decision because the kingdom is here. We can either accept that, we embrace that, and have the kingdom come and fill our lives like that, that rock becomes a mountain and fills the whole earth. It can fill our whole lives. Or we can take offense at that and say, I want to rule and reign my own life. Thank you very much. I will make the decisions of what's important for me. The kingdom of God is a, is a kingdom that doesn't leave you any room for third choices. 
It's binary. It's a yes or a no. Either you are choosing for one of the kingdoms of the statue, or you are choosing for the kingdom of the rock that comes and smashes the statue. There is no third option. This is the call of Jesus for us today, to repent and to believe the good news of the kingdom of God. Let us pray. Father God, we know this morning as we gather here that you are present with us. We know that you are the king on the throne. And we know that your presence came through Jesus Christ. We know that your presence is with us still through the Holy Spirit. And we know that people today still have to make a choice whether to submit to your rule and reign in their lives or to choose to, to be their own rulers of their own lives. They have to choose for one of the kingdoms of the world represented by the statue in the dream of Nebuchadnezzar or they could choose for the kingdom of the rock that becomes a mountain and fills the whole earth. They can choose to stand up or they can choose to bow their knee. I pray, Lord, that you would help us make a wise decision in our own lives. I pray, Lord, that you would help us embrace your kingdom, your rule and your reign in all of our lives, in every department, in every area, in every moment. This is our prayer in Jesus' name.